Good evening and welcome to our very first webinar for the Springfield and Central Illinois African American History Museum. I'm Jamie Stout, a volunteer board member for the African American History Museum. Some of you may recognize me from my full time job at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation, as I know some of you have joined in for our webinars there as well. Due to the COVID closures throughout the state, our museum is temporarily closed. But let me assure you, there are still a lot of things happening behind the scenes to get us ready for when we are open again. But we still have a mission of sharing African American history stories from our local communities. And we feel this is the best way to share those right now with these webinars. It still gives us a chance to be together safely. So we also want to give a special shout out to some community partners who shared this with their audience tonight as well like Dana Thomas House, Illinois State Museum, Urban League, and Illinois State Historical Society. Tonight, we are joined by Mary Francis. She's gonna tell us about her research and documentary on Eva Carol Monroe and the Lincoln Colored Home. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about Mary Francis. She earned her bachelor's in anthropology from the University of Iowa, her master's in environmental studies from UIS, a PhD in natural resources and environmental sciences from U of I in Champaign. And she is currently a in college instructor in environmental science and an art business owner. Mary has been displaying her art in group exhibits throughout the Midwest. Galleries have shown her work include Women Made Gallery in Chicago and Art St. Louis in St. Louis. So, Throughout tonight's presentation, we encourage you to ask questions. So how you do that is just type in the question and answer box below, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. Tonight, Mary Frances is gonna be showing us a presentation along with her PowerPoint. So again, if you have questions, just type those below and we'll have time towards the end to get to your questions as well. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Mary Frances. Thank you, Jamie, I appreciate it. And welcome everyone. I do wanna say, Jamie, I, I'm PhD ABD, all but dissertation. So I just wanted to correct that. And if you have seen the documentary film, Eva Carol Monroe and the Lincoln Colored Home, if you could just hover at the bottom of your screen, if you see raised hand, if you could click on that for me, I'd just like to see how many of you have seen the film. So tonight, my presentation will be based on that film, but I. I've found some new information I'd like to present, and I am going to show you a series of pictures. And I'll talk about, first of all, people in Eva's life who were important to her and who I think had a strong influence on her. And then we'll look at the Lincoln Colored Home and talk about some of the day-to-day, -day, um, how it operated day-to-day. -day. And then we'll look at a letter actually written by Eva in her own handwriting. And then we'll look more closely at Eva and who she was as a woman and different stages of her life. So some of these pictures are the actual people and some of them are representations. And this is a representation of Richard Carroll, who was Eva's father. And I believe that Richard had an extremely strong influence on Eva. He was born an enslaved person in Missouri and he escaped slavery to join the Union Army. And he served for about six months in the Army. He traveled during that time. He was in um, Tennessee and Virginia and Cairo, Illinois, and he eventually ended up in Kiwani. And he started a family there. And Richard had at least 10 children that I know of. And the first seven were girls. And the last, uh, sorry, yeah, the first eight were girls. No, does that work? So anyway, <laughs> there were a lot of daughters and the last two that I know of um, were sons and they both died in infancy. So he, he had a large family his whole life. Um, and he had some tragedy around the death of his infant sons. And also his first wife died when um, Eva was 12. So 
Um, Richard ended up marrying again about two and a half years later, and he moved to Macomb, Illinois. And then eventually he ended up having five um, wives and he ended up living in Springfield. So why did I choose this picture of Richard Carroll? <clears throat> well, I know from his military records that Richard was a, a short man. He was between 5'5 five five and 5'7. Five um, he was extremely patriotic and he was proud of his service in the Civil War. And so in the picture, you can see that um, he is actually wearing a, just a second here, he's wearing a, um, a pin on his chest that is a Grand Army of the Republic pin. So I don't know for sure if he was a member of the GAR, but it would be fitting that he would, he would wear something like that. And he's surrounded by children and Richard had grandchildren, especially in Springfield and, um, and he was um, a devoted family member. So he would have spent time with them. Richard was also a political activist. He, he uh, believed that people should vote. They should participate in the, um, in the democratic process. He strongly encouraged African-Americans to work and he was an outspoken man. He traveled around Illinois. He gave speeches. He was um, a dedicated member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church also. So this is a picture I chose to um, represent um, Eva's mother. And Eva's mother's name was Mary Frey Carroll. And she was from Kentucky. She was about five years younger than Richard. And she died, like I said, when Eva was about 12 years old. So I don't know much about Mary. I know she was a member of the AME church and she died. Actually, she had a chronic case of scarlet fever and she died giving birth to their first son. And so the next one is actually Ollie. And Ollie is a younger sister of Eva. And this is, this is really Ollie. And they were extremely close their whole lives. And they had a lot in common. Um, Ollie and Eva were involved in the same civic organizations. They uh, helped and supported each other. Um, Ollie lived at the house, the Lincoln Colored Home, for a while, and she helped Eva there. And then when Eva was hit by a car, um, Ollie visited her on a regular basis and helped care for her. And then when Eva died in a nursing home, um, Ollie helped with her funeral arrangements, and Ollie actually bought Eva's burial plot, and she bought a uh, spot right beside Eva for her own grave. So they are buried side by side at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield. Now I chose this picture to represent Beatrice and Beatrice, as far as I know, was Eva's only child and Beatrice was a rebel. She, at the age of about 15, um, it was in the newspaper, she became involved with drugs. So there was some activity with opium and cocaine. Um, she began stealing money from uh, Richard Carroll and, and one of Eva's sisters. And she was charged with larceny and she was sent to a juvenile uh, detention center for girls in, um, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. Um, in Illinois, uh, sorry, in Geneva, Illinois. So Beatrice spent three years there. And when she got out, she came back to Springfield and lived with Eva at the Lincoln Colored Home. And she immediately got married to an African-American man. They moved to Milwaukee and he deserted her after about 18 years. And a couple of years after that, Beatrice tried to marry a white man in Milwaukee and the, the marriage 
license was announced in the newspaper and the Ku Klux Klan saw it and found out. And on a Friday night, they burned a cross in each of their home, at each of their homes. And while they were burning the crosses, they had a huge KKK meeting where around 800 people attended. There was a national representative there. And um, it ended up that they called off the wedding. But after that, um, Beatrice did remarry an African-American man. And I don't know much about her life after the KKK incident, but I do know she ended up in Idlewild, Michigan, which was a resort town for African-Americans. And it was also in the Green Book. <laughs> so it's Mary and Susan Lawrence of the Dana Thomas House, the Frank Lloyd Wright House in Springfield. And both of them, I think, were instrumental in Eva's career, professional career with the Lincoln Colored Home. Um, Mary was the one who intervened around 1904 and um, helped Eva get out of debt and um, built the new home for her. She died shortly after that. So that left Susan um, more in control of what was going on in the Lincoln Colored Home. And Susan's relationship with Eva was strained at times. They didn't always get along. And um, Susan didn't always want to have the responsibility of the home. So, but she, she did stay in Eva's life um, pretty much until her death. So this is an actual picture of Maisie Mallory and she's the second from the right. She's beside her husband. <clears throat> Maisie Mallory was an extremely creative and gifted artist, musician. She played the harp. She was an opera singer and she played other instruments too. She was from Indiana. And she uh, would travel in the United States and Europe as a musician with this group, uh, which was called the Mallory Brothers. And I, I saw the reviews written up of them in the newspapers all over the country and they were a wonderful group. And after she stopped playing music, she settled in central Illinois in Jacksonville, had a family, and she used to come to the Lincoln Colored Home and play her harp at some of the events. And then after she became widowed, she went back to the Lincoln Colored Home and she lived there and she worked there as a secretary. I think it was for about seven years. So I think her and um, Eva were friends and they were professional partners. They, Eva was a singer too. She sang in the church choir. So her, I think her and um, her and Maisie had a lot in common with the arts. And the arts were something that Eva was trying to um, bring into the Lincoln Colored Home. It was part of um, helping helping her race at that time to bring culture. So now I'm going to talk about the Lincoln Colored Home. And this is a picture of it around 1910. So it's about six years old. And <clears throat> it, um, it was most of the time overcrowded. So there was a basement there, um, but at times there were 36 residents living there. And that's not even counting staff. So um, if you look closely to the right of the house, you can see another building there. And that was an apartment building built around um, 1910. So around 1930, um, they, and I'm not sure if it was Eva or the other people she was associated with, were, were able to acquire this apartment building and they turned it into a boy's annex because obviously they needed more space and so that was in operation until um, Eva had to close down the home in 1933 and then the building disappeared. So what were the daily activities at the Lincoln Colored Home? Well, every day they had three meals and I saw the menu. Um, I was amazed at the variety of food they had and how healthy it, it seemed. They had well-balanced diet of lots of different kinds of meat um, beef, pork, chicken, fish. Um, they had um, vegetables, fruits, um, carbohydrates. They drank milk almost every meal, bread and butter. 
Then they also had desserts. And most of the time the staff ate the same thing the children ate, but um, sometimes they had a little better quality meal. And there would have, sometimes there would have been uh, an assistant matron living there, um, a secretary living there, some, a cook there, uh, someone doing laundry. And then of course, Eva was always, always living there. Now, what kind of involvement did Eva have in the day-to-day -day activities? My hypothesis is that she didn't have a lot of involvement, that she left it to her staff because Eva was um, active in these civic organizations. She traveled around Illinois and Iowa to bring more residents back to the home. Um, she was a probation officer, so she had to spend time at the Sangamon County Court. She had to place the children in homes. She had to follow up with the children and check, check on them. And uh, she had to probably visit the schools to check on the children. So she, and she went to conventions for her civic organization. She was traveling. So she had a lot on her plate. And what happened eventually was, it, like I said, it became overcrowded. Um, there wasn't enough money to pay the staff. They were underpaid. Um, some of this, it became, the stuff in the house became outdated. And um, so things went a little bit downhill as, as the years went on. Um, so by the way, for people who don't know, this house is actually still standing on the east side. The porch has collapsed, but everything else pretty much looks the same. So this is a wonderful document. It's the, um, it's the primary document that I think is at the heart of my research. And it's the only um, handwritten piece that I have of Eva's. So this is a letter she wrote in May of 1912. And I just found out so many things just from having this letter. And I can see they were doing well enough to have letterhead. They list their officers and their directors. They have a picture of the home on there. I see that Eva is an eloquent writer. She uses effusive language. She refers to Susan as a, a great, big, beautiful doll. And this letter is to Susan, um, Susan Lawrence, who had just gotten married. And so Eva goes into her uh, religious Christian beliefs, values around marriage, how excited she is for Susan. Um, and she makes a joke at the end about guess who's next, like maybe Eva's going to get married next. And um, it's, I can see she's highly literate. There's only a few spelling errors. She has a beautiful signature here. You can see Eva. And this other signature is actually from another document. But it's interesting because I see that even though she was a widow, she was still using Mrs. And she's using her uh, maiden name of Carol, and she, then she's using Monroe, which was the, her married name with her um, second husband. So now I'm going to go into Eva. Eva, um, I have four pictures of Eva that I could find. This is a young Eva, obviously. Um, on Eva's death certificate, her, her um, birthday is August 4th, 1869. But when I look at the census data and her marriage certificates, I think her birthday was in 1867, but I can't find a birth certificate. So um, when she was 12, her mother died. She grew up in Kiwani. And Two and a half years after her mother died, um, her father remarried. So there was a stepmother in the home. Um, regardless, she, had, she still had seven younger siblings at, at this time. And um, about two years after her stepmother came into the home, Eva, Eva got married. So Eva was around 16 when she got married um, and to an African-American man. And then she had Beatrice with him. So it lasted about 10 years and then he divorced her for adultery. And this was in the, in a newspaper in Missouri. And I can just imagine how scandalous and embarrassing it was to have that in the newspaper. 
So about a year later, um, she married another man, Andrew Monroe, and that only lasted a few years. And then after that, she claims to be a widow, but I can't find any evidence of that husband's death, but she does um, refer to him affectionately. And so this, I'm using this picture as um, her teens and her 20s. By the age of 20, Eva had already joined the Women's Relief Corps, which was associated with the GAR. She was active in that. She had joined the National Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Um, she had already started the Lincoln Color Home in 1898. Uh, she was well on her way to a professional career. And this was also the time in 1901 where her daughter was sent away to the juvenile detention center. So Eva at this time has no husband and, and no children. So this picture is between 1901, 1905. And you can see uh, Eva is physically a beautiful woman. She's wearing a Christian cross. You can see how uh, important her faith is to her. And um, so here she's really becoming professionally active with the Lincoln Color Home and continuing her civic engagements. And this is Eva in her late 60s, and this is around 1937. So by this time, the home has winded down. Um, she has been through a lot, and she kept the home going despite everything. She's still active in her organizations. At oh, this time, she's given um, higher leadership roles. So she has, um, she's, been, she's been president of the state organization, um, she, the local organization. She's appointed to positions with national organizations. So it's obvious she has extremely strong leadership skills. She's still living at the Lincoln Colored Home, even though it was shut down in, around 1933. And this is the final picture I have of Eva. And um, here I see a, um, a, strong, a strong woman, um, a little, maybe a little bit of an intimidating um, presence you know, to the children, um, mature woman. And most importantly here, I see her, um, sorry, I see that she's wearing a pin just like her father, you see this pin here is the pin of the Women's Relief Corps, which was the um, auxiliary organization to help Civil War veterans. So and by this time, she's been in that organization for over 50 years. So next, I just want to show you these pictures of Eva all together and um, I want you to look at them and you can use your chat box and just tell me what do you see in these pictures? Use some adjectives to describe Eva here um, and Jamie can handle those. So for instance, in the first picture, I see a, um, I see a proud, a proud, uh, confident young, um, in the second picture, a physically beautiful woman, Christian faith. Um, and the other two, um, I see a mature um, professional woman. And so we will uh, move on here. <clears throat> Also, she looks like an elegant dresser. Uh, she enjoyed wearing jewelry and looks like later in life, um, she was wearing glasses. So I'm gonna finish up here shortly, but as an epilogue, um, one of the things I wanted to do when I started this work was I wanted to get gravestones for the people um, that I was learning about because some of them didn't have gravestones and they were buried in potter's fields. And it was actually mostly the women who didn't have gravestones. So 
I was able to purchase a gravestone for Mary Carol, um, Eva's mother, and she buried in Kiwani, and that was placed a few months ago. And there were three people in Springfield who donated to get a stone for Eva. And you can see it's a beautiful stone, and that, that was placed um, a few months ago at Oak Ridge Cemetery. And I'm, I'm just really happy to find those. Um, I also am working on a stone in Kiwani for, excuse me, in Macomb for one of um, uh, Richard's infant sons. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was fantastic. We, uh, I know I've learned a lot um, watching the documentary and even learned a lot more with this presentation. Um, we do have some questions coming in, um, so uh, we'll get we'll get to those. Um, and one of them is, are there any other oral history interviews of anybody else who might have lived at the Colored Home? Lived at the Colored Home. I, I could not find any. I, I hope there are some out there. I'd love to find some, but I, the only two oral histories I found were of women who knew, visited the home or knew Eva and, uh, but they didn't actually live at the home. And those were oral histories done here in Springfield. And I did listen to those, but are, yeah. yeah. Um, Mike from the audience is asking, are there records of people who lived at the colored home? Are there census records or are there any other type of records? Absolutely, Mike. Um, if you watch the documentary film, I included the census records in the film. So you can see they actually they listed all the residents living at the home. So you can see their, their names. Very good, very good. Um, one of the questions that I had, um, and I've looked it up, but other, it's also coming in is, you mentioned the home still stands. Can you give us a rough idea of where it is so that maybe we could drive by and see it? Sure, the home is at 427 South 12th Street in Springfield, Illinois. And um, when it was originally built, it was a, a, it was a residential area, but it did have, um, stores like grocery stores, saloons, meat markets. Um, and it had some industry too. There was a stone and marble company there. It had a school, Lincoln School was about a block away and that's where the kids from the home went. Um, it had, um, <clears throat> had a church a couple blocks down the street. Um, so it was a, mixed, a mixed neighborhood, but on the east side of Springfield, even at that time it was um, it was primarily African American people living there. It wasn't quite as wealthy as the west side of town. Like for instance, on the west side, they had a trolley service there, but where Eva lived, they didn't have the trolley service yet. Um, the, the homes would have been nice, um, wood frame, well-capped homes, and the streets were not paved in the beginning. They, they had curbs though. So it was a, I think it was a, a pretty decent neighborhood. And I do believe from the old maps that I saw from like the mid 1800s that Eva bought the original structure that was on that lot when she started the home in 1898. I think that was the original house there. So, when I Googled it, you can see it. It's kind of down the street on 12th Street. There's that little turnabout thing, um, mm -hmm. Capitol and 12th. And so it's just a couple houses down there on the right-hand side. So it yeah. still is there. So definitely when you're by, take a look at it. Um, one of the questions that's come in is where did the residents of the home come from? How did they come to live there? Good, good question. So again, you can see where they came from, from the census records, which are in the documentary film. And most of the kids came from around Illinois or surrounding states. Some of them came from Arkansas. And how did they end up at the home? That's a, that's a great question. Most of the kids were um, uh, uh, appointed, I guess you say, or they came from the, the county court system. So. There was a reason why they were there. They didn't just come off the street. 
Um, some of the kids were juvenile delinquents, so they were either on their way to a detention center or they were coming out of a detention center. Some of the kids were extremely poor and their parents just couldn't afford to take care of them anymore. Some of the kids um, were homeless because back then that was a crime for a child to be homeless. And there were some, I believe, pregnant teenagers, um, but Eva was adamant about telling people that you had to go through the county court system to get into the home. And I didn't say this, but Eva was a probation officer and I believe she was the first African-American one for Sangamon County. And that happened in 1901. So Eva herself had to um, make recommendations to the county court system to send, you know, to send people send these children to different places. So she was, she kind of wore a lot of hats. Um, she was a social worker, she was a probation officer. And I think, it, I think it would have been challenging for her. And so a lot of different kinds of children mixed together in the home. And then you have adults living there too. And then you have males and females living there. And as you can imagine, it became an issue especially with the males and females, there were sexual scandals that happened. And um, I think it may have been part of the reason why they purchased the apartment building right next door and made that the boys annex. Sure. One of the questions coming in is why did um, Mary Agnes Lawrence choose Eva to direct the home? Oh, that's a great, great question. And I'm, this is, speculation, but as I said, Eva was already um, on her professional path before she, before she got involved with the Lawrence women. So Eva had already bought that home in 1898. She was already taking in orphans and widows. She was in these um, civic organizations. So I'm sure that Mary, um, saw what she was doing and Mary became aware that she was having financial problems with that home. And so that was the point where she decided to step in and help out. And then another question that's coming in, can you go back and tell us a little bit more about the relationship with um, Susan Lawrence? Sure, um, this is a, this one's difficult to understand. And I've had many conversations with, uh, the Dana Thomas House Foundation about, because I, I want to understand it myself, but <clears throat> I think from a letter that um, Susan wrote around 1915, a, a long letter, um, she was frustrated with Eva. Um, Eva was underpaid. Sometimes she had a salary, sometimes she didn't. And when she felt like she needed more money, she would go to Susan and say, hey, I, I want a salary. I want to make more money. And this, this made Susan pretty mad. And it just, it got on her nerves. And um, I, I really do think the 1915, um, 1915 was a turning point in their relationship. And I say that because in 1915, um, Susan uh, created a charter and she incorporated um, an industrial school for girls and boys in Springfield. And this is, this is a, sort of a reorganization of the Lincoln Colored Home. So what she was planning to do was keep the Lincoln Colored Home for orphans and widows, but they were going to try to purchase another building and make that into an industrial school industrial school to teach them a skill, <laughs> which that all sounds great. But when I go back to the letter and I, I see what Susan said about that, it was part of a scheme to kind of get rid of Eva. That's horrible to say, but Susan really wanted at that point for Eva to leave. 
she wanted her to get married and get, get rid of her like that, or she was thinking she could do this industrial school thing and then she could hire someone else to run everything. So I think that was part of it. It was sort of a behind the, behind the scenes type of attitude she had about Eva. And it just, it, it wasn't good. It really was, <laughs> but I don't know how else to. No, yeah, that's okay. You mentioned that um, Susan Lawrence had helped to fund the house um, or the home. Was there any other funding or where did it, how did it run? How did it make it possible? Yeah, it was primarily from the Sangamon County court system. So when the court would send a child over there to live, they would also pay the home a certain amount of money like per month for the, for the child. So they got a lot of money like that. There was also a, a, a social services agency, like a regional agency that provided money for them. They were private donations. And um, yeah, and there were people involved on the board of directors who had a lot of money like Joseph Bunn. Um, I, I'm sure they helped out. They did fundraisers uh, in the community. Oh. Kind of like what we do now. Yeah. A little bit of everything. That's yeah. all good. Um, Nell Clay is asking, she's saying that uh, Eva obviously looks very confident. Um, and do you have any examples of how she, she showed how she was very strong or an outspoken woman? Good, thanks Nell. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, and yeah, there's a great one and it's, it's in the film. Um, Eva gave a speech at, um, it was a woman's uh, relief corps convention in, uh, I, I think it was in the 1930s. So Eva would have been in her late sixties, but they had just given her a national um, position with the woman's relief corps. And then she, so Eva gave a speech and she said, um, she said, I'm gonna create these other posts around central Illinois. I'm gonna create another post in Decatur. I'm gonna create a post in Jacksonville and you watch me and I know I can do it. I know I will succeed. That's exactly what she said. I mean, it was amazing um, to see that. And I, I also wanna say in that speech, Eva mentioned her father. And she talked about him with admiration and respect and, and emotion. So, and Eva's father was very um, confident and driven and ambitious. So I, she may have got some of it from him. Sounds like she was pretty a determined, powerful lady. Um, yeah. lots, lots of questions are coming in about the home now. Um, are there any preservation efforts for it? Do we know who owns it now or what are the current state of this home? Yes, um, <clears throat> I do know who owns the home. I'm not at liberty to uh, give out that- the Local owner. Yeah, I'm not able to give out that information. And there are some preservation efforts in the works, but I, I can't talk about those. To be determined, so coming up. Right. <laughs> All right, hopefully that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, Vicki is asking, uh, where is Eva buried again? Eva is buried in a potter's field, which is um, the, the poorer area for indigent, indigent people, indigent people in Oak Ridge Cemetery. And it's, it's almost in the colored section, the Northwest portion of Oak Ridge Cemetery. It's sort of on the, like the South um, Eastern border of the, the colored section. And, and like I said, Eva is buried right beside her sister, Ollie. And Ollie doesn't have a gravestone yet. So if anyone's interested in helping out with Ollie's stone, that would be wonderful. Um, their father, Richard Carroll, was a Civil War veteran, so he has a stone, an old stone, but he's buried in a different section of Oak Ridge Cemetery. That's good. That's good to know. I see LaShonda Fitch out there. She's the director of the Oak Ridge Cemetery, so 
Um, I'm sure she can help us with any of that stuff as well. So yes, great shout out. Um, we could always raise some funds to help get Ollie a gravestone as well. Mm -hmm. um, lots of questions coming in. Everybody loves it. Um, how did you decide to make this documentary film about Eva and the Colored Home? A lot of it was George Floyd. I just really felt so bad about that. And I, I wanted to do something locally to honor uh, an African-American person. And I had gone by the colored home. I didn't know what it was. And I did a little research and I didn't hardly find anything about Eva. And I thought, you know what? We're in a pandemic. I have time. I'm, I want to make a film. I never made a documentary film before. That's awesome. That's great. That's fantastic. That's how these stories live on um, for legacies and be able to be told for future generations. So we appreciate that. Um, what were some obstacles that you faced doing some of the research? Obstacles. Um, you know, the, one of the obstacles actually was emotional. Um, I don't think I was prepared for the amount of racism and violence that happened in some of their lives, especially with Beatrice, with um, uh, going to the juvenile detention center and finding out the director was torturing the girls. And uh, the director was obviously a white supremacist, was a female. Um, and then the KKK incident with Beatrice, um, it just, you know, Richard being in the Civil War and probably seeing um, horrible battles. And it just, it was overwhelming sometimes, especially when it just happened with George Floyd. I'm like, wow, this, this is still happening. And um, th there were a couple times when I would find something out in my research and I would just have to take a couple days off, you know, kind of get my energy back because it was, it was draining. It could be draining. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely an emotional um, story for sure from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Don is asking, was this home and its operation affected by the 1908 race riots that we know of? Great, great question. And, you know, Don, I, I don't know. I haven't found any evidence of it. Uh, it could be in the newspapers. I just haven't found it. Um, Bren is also asking, have you reached out for any other Springfield Black families oral accounts? Do we know if there are any other oral histories that might relate to this? I, I don't know. I haven't reached out, but I think that is a, a huge area for research in, in, with this project. Um, a lot of people want to be able to hear stories from the orphans, you know, people related to the orphans. Um, I will give a shout out to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum. Um, Dr. Mark DePew has a ton of oral histories and he does also have a very large section of African-American oral histories from here in Springfield and central Illinois. So uh, those are available free and online. So you could definitely go to their website, presidentlincoln.illinois.gov and get many of those. Um, so we could all do a little bit more research, but it doesn't sound like any that we know of might have a tie right here, but we're certain they're out there. That's for sure. Um, so that, that's good. That's good. Um, Bill is asking, did the Lincoln Colored Home have students that went to Lincoln School? If not, where did the kids go to school? They did. They did, Bill. They went to Lincoln School. That's where they went, about a block away. Um, Jamie, I do want to say something about the last question about the oral histories. There, there was a, um, a small booklet written about the Lincoln home, and it was about when they did the investigation in the 1930s, and it was a six-month investigation. A woman came down from Chicago, and she observed what was going on in the home, and she interviewed the children that were living there, and the 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 interviews were were not good the children you know i'm just i don't know what's true and what's not but that's where the scathing reports came from from those interviews with the children and i talk about that in the documentary film 
So speaking of everyone's wanting to know where can they find the documentary film and how can they watch that? Yeah, I created a website just for the film. So that's on wixsite.com. And um, I don't know, Jamie, maybe you can mail out the we definitely can. Um, for everyone that's attending tonight, we have their email addresses. So I can put that link to the documentary film in that email. because You'll get a follow-up email tomorrow within 24 hours. Um, we'll also share it out on our website and um, even put it out on our social media. So everyone can check back within 24 to 48 hours and we'll get that posted for everyone. But you could also Google it and I think you'll find it, but we'll definitely share it out for everyone. Um, yeah, you can, also go, um, you can go to YouTube and just type in the name, the title of the film, and it, you'll see it. You can watch it on YouTube. Perfect, perfect. Um, lots of other questions coming in. Um, what was maybe one of the most surprising things that you found out while doing this research? Oh, it had it had to be it had to be the KKK incident in Milwaukee. That was just like that was earth shattering for me. I mean, it was horrible. And to happen to Eva's daughter, I mean, Eva and her dad were racial, you know, activists and trying to uplift uh, African Americans and that this happened. And I actually worked with the um, Milwaukee Public Library and the Historical Society there. And when I told them that this had happened, that I saw it in the newspaper, they were just shocked they were astounded they had no idea that this KKK incident had happened in Milwaukee and these are people that lived there for a long time and worked there and so they were interested in helping me document what happened and the the house I show in the film was the actual house of the white man that um, Beatrice was going to marry. So that was the actual yard where they burned the cross. That man that helped me in Milwaukee um, found that house for me. So yeah, it was the KKK. The other thing I was surprised about was these women didn't have gravestones. I mean, the men had gravestones. <laughs> That's actually one of the questions from Lisa as well out in the audience, it says, Eva died with no money to bury her or to give her a proper headstone. How did that work back then? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure, but Maisie Mallory doesn't have a gravestone. Her husband and all her kids have a gravestone. Eva doesn't have one. Um, Mary didn't have one. So the only thing I can think is it's e either poverty or gender bias or both. Not sure. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I, we would have to ask LaShonda on that one. So maybe she can follow up with us on any more history on that and we can share it out as well um, to everyone. But that's a great question. Unfortunately, it probably still happens in some situations. Um, what were some big influences on Eva and um, her life? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, so I think her father was a huge, a huge influence you know, I, I've seen written a lot that Eva um, probably became nurturing and wanted to work with children because her mother died at a young age and she had to take care of her siblings. But I didn't find any evidence of that. I didn't find that Eva was at home taking care of all the siblings. And because that mother came in and then Eva got married at a young age. So I think it was her father's example of being a former slave and then serving in the Civil War and how he pushed people to reach their potential. And the other influence I think was the Women's Relief Corps, which again was related to the Civil War. And then the uh, Federation of, um, the National Federation of Women's um, Clubs because their mottos, their mission, missions were to um, do charity work, community work, and uplift the um, uplift other African Americans. So, and she was in those organizations almost her whole life. So those were big, and those were women that she was working with, and and so 
she could possibly avoid the gender bias. She had the support of a lot of um, a lot of women. And I think her sister Ollie was an influence because she was just always there as a loving sister and, and friend. Mm -hmm. um, how can we help to honor Eva in the story of the Lincoln Colored Home? Oh, thank you for, thank you for asking. Um, I'm on this mission to get as many gravestones as I can. So any financial help with that would be wonderful. I did um, suggest Eva's name for Douglas Park in Springfield, but she wasn't chosen. So, I mean, things like that, we can, we can all do that. Um, continue to research and get it out there to people in different ways. Um, I'm also going to write an academic article with um, a colleague about Eva's father, Richard Carroll, and we're going to try to get that into an Illinois history journal relatively soon. So, um, and then if you guys have any ideas, just let me know. I'm, I'm willing to keep working on this research. Perfect. We can always share your information out um, with everyone who's attended as well tonight. If they have any further questions, they can always reach out to you or share any research, research that they also might find. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the way these things continue to get told and evolve. So um, what's your next project, Mary? Next project, um, I'm not sure, but I definitely want to work on this um, academic article on Richard Carroll. So that's that's going to be my my first priority now. Perfect, perfect. Um, one last question has come in from Bryn. Um, was Eva active in the suffrage movement at all? I didn't find any direct evidence of that, but that was... Um, that was definitely one of the issues that the um, National Federation of Colored Women's Clubs worked on. So even though they were, you know, they were um, serving um, African Americans, they were they were working on um, suffrage. They were working on um, lynching, um, children and widows, um, voting rights. Um, Let's see. Yeah. So she was, but I, I don't have any evidence that she was directly working on that issue. I think her focus was more on um, orphans and, and widows. Sure. That's great. Well, as we wrap up, Mary, I just want to thank you so much um, for volunteering to uh, work with me over the past month to get this organized for our members here at the African American History Museum. I learned a lot. I know everyone in the audience is going to go check out the documentary and learn a lot and even more. Um, the discussion was very helpful um, to really make it come alive for everyone tonight. So we appreciate your time with that. Um, tonight's presentation is being recorded and we will share it on the museum's website and Facebook in the very near future. We do encourage you to share this with others in your life and encourage them to also become a member of the African American History Museum so that we can continue to tell stories just like this one. We also wanna make you aware of some upcoming virtual programming that we have for our members and community. On February 10th, we will be joined by two producers from New York who host a podcast called Driving the Green Book. So watch for those details coming this week. I will get that finalized. In April, we're gonna have a webinar on the Negro Baseball League um, that we're coordinating with our new exhibit opening. And I'm sure you've seen the news tonight that the Negro Baseball League was accepted into the um, major league. So that's fantastic. And it's super timely for our exhibit. Very exciting. So we'll also have a webinar coming up soon on that. So check back to um, make sure you signed up for our emails, check back to our website and Facebook often um, for these. And as we close out the webinar tonight, you will see a short survey. So please help help us out by taking that. It'll take you less than 60 seconds. It also helps us to know what kind of offerings you want to see in the future. Um, if you know somebody that would be interested in topic, talking um, or have an interest that you want to share, let me know, get a hold of me. Um, and if you do choose so, we would be very grateful for any contribution, big or small, so that we can continue to tell authentic stories 
about African American life in Central Illinois, the past, the present, celebrating and sharing our history and culture. You can make those donations at our website at spiaahm.org. And again, thank you guys all so much for joining tonight. We wish you well, and we will see you in 2021. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.